Hey there, there, guys. Welcome to this edition of the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. It is our pre-draft show. We are super excited to bring this to you tonight. I got two guys that I couldn't think of any better way to spend pre-draft night with than Greg Thompson and Russell Brown. Guys, what is happening tonight? What's going on, everybody? Uh, doing well. Thanks for bringing me back on. Uh, didn't mess up the intro this time, so we're doing it live. <laughs> yeah, it's a, your show's not typically live, so uh, we we throw a little curveball at you and we go live over yeah. here. If you guys don't know, Russell does a ton of work over here at Cover One, uh, always providing great draft content for everybody, and he also runs the Cover One uh, Draft Podcast, which is way better than our podcast. Um, <laughs> just not Bill's focus, but much more professional, uh, and they know a lot more. But speaking of our podcast, I got Greg, man. How you doing? I love that shirt, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one of the new uh, 26 shirts uh, designs just got this yesterday. Uh, uh, so excited to rock the the newest one, and obviously in honor of the uh, new movie premiere that a few people may be excited for tonight. Uh, looking forward to uh, having a good show here and getting ready for the draft. And Ross, I don't like your shirt as much. That's, kind of, <laughs> that's, that's all right. I At least it's shirt. regular green and not yeah. bright neon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, guys, we're going to get right into this tonight. Before we get too deep, though, I'll tell you about the cover one stuff later. You, most of you already know, but this show is sponsored by the Buffalo Sports Card Convention. It's a local sports card and memorabilia show that takes place at the Polish Falcons, uh, at the Polish Falcons in Depew, New York. And it's every other month right now. Their next show is coming up on May 18th from 930 a.m. to 230 p.m. It's a two dollar mission. There's a ton of great vendors that go. Uh, if you want more information on Twitter, it's at BSC Convention. And then on Facebook, Buffalo Sports Card Convention. And then they're online, buffalosportscardconvention.com. Tonight, they are giving away a signed Stevie Johnson autographed picture and a signed Trey White. I don't know how to say signed autograph, but anyway. Part of my redundancy, two autograph pictures. Uh, we'll have two winners that we'll pick at the end of the episode. So stay in the chat here on YouTube. Uh, we'll pick out of the people that are in the chat. And let's get into the show. We'll talk about that stuff a little bit more later. But Russ ha is a busy man this time of year. And he's got radio gigs and stuff to write up. And this is his Christmas. So I don't want to yes. keep them all night here. Let's get right into it, Russ. We've had mock drafts on this show more times than I want to deal with. But I want to get your final here lead up to our pick you've done a lot of big boards i helped you with the graphic design on your big board i love what you've done there you've been doing draft podcasts for as long as you can so i can't think of anybody better to give me a good scenario here one through eight that is somewhat realistic that the bills can expect and then we can talk about who the bills are going to select so let's get right out out of, out of the gate arizona's at one what are we doing it's got to be Kyler Murray. I mean, that's that's pretty much been in the rumor mill for months and months and months now, it seems like. And I would be shocked if they went in another direction, to be honest. I think Cliff Kingsbury's got some pull um, within the organization. I think that's going to be the guy that he ultimately selects. Um, and, and they're going to build this around Cliff and, and his offense. And I think Kyler Murray's going to be that guy. So uh, Kyler at one. Yeah, I don't think that's a shocker to anybody here. Obviously, you're hearing a bunch of smoke today about what could possibly happen with that pick. Uh, I guess we'll see. You got San Francisco right behind them. And this is one that I've seen a lot of, not a ton of different things, but for the number two pick, obviously, they can go a different, couple different ways here. Where are you at with San Francisco? Well, and I'll, and I'll tell you, I think at one and two, I would certainly be more into taking Quinn and Williams if I was either one of those teams. Um, and I certainly think Quinn and Williams could be the guy at two, but I, I think it's going to be Nick Bosa. Uh, you know, part of it's, you know, DeForest Buckner off the edge with 12 sacks last year could be tempting for Williams, but Nick Bosa makes the most sense. He's a, just a natural fit for them in that four, three defense. And, and you plug in uh, Bosa right away opposite of D Ford with, with Buckner and Armstead. And I think you've got one of the best young defensive lines in uh, football. So I, I like Bosa for them. Yeah, and a lot of quarterbacks in that division that they're going to have to be chasing around over the next few years here trying to disrupt. So that totally makes a lot of sense for them. Yep. Th this pick, just a reminder, you're on a Bills fan show. So mm -hmm. careful here with the New York Jets pick. Let's not give them something too good. Let's see if McCagnin yeah. can, can mess this up a little bit. No, I mean, to me, this is a no-brainer if it falls this way. What do you think they're doing at three? Clayton Thorson. No, I'm <laughs> You know, I, uh, I've got to go with Quinn and Williams. He's the best player on the board. Now, I will say I've been on, you know, like uh, you mentioned, a couple of radio spots here and there, and I, I've mentioned them being a trade-down 
potential team, a, a candidate to trade down. And I think it's possible, but I truthfully, the New York Giants, the New York Jets will never make a trade. I never see that happening. It just does not make sense um, for one team helping the other team getting a, a franchise quarterback. And I say that because of all the rumors circulating around Dwayne Haskins, Daniel Jones. So the Giants could certainly be in a position to move from six to three, but I just don't see that happening. So I think Quinn Williams will be the guy at three. Um, he's a plug and play nose tackle that you would put in the middle of your defense with Leonard Williams. Um, and I think that's a, a big help to, to that defense. And maybe they'll move some picks around uh, next year or, or on day two of this draft where they could build up the offense around Sam Darnold a little bit. Um, but again, Quinn and Williams at three makes the most sense. Yeah, I do not want to face Quinn in <laughs> twice a year. I don't know about you, Greg. I don't like that for Mitch Moore. Uh, I've convinced myself that the Jets are now super into analytics, and PFF told me that that means you should take cornerbacks, and they're going to take a cornerback at three. There you go. <laughs> and we're hearing today that the Redskins are maybe trying to get up to that spot, which yeah. I think they'll have to do that, that, quite that a bit of a package. That crap out of me yeah. because the Redskins are, can very easily be dumb, and if they want to be dumb to the Raiders, I think I'm okay with that. I'm okay with giving Gruden and Mayak a bunch of picks. Don't be stupid to the Jets and give them some crazy – treasure trove of yeah. picks that's going to take as, me off as dumb as i think mccagnon is he's going to hit on some of those he so. won't miss on all of them <laughs> yeah I, mean, all I, right. I really wanted to take dk metcalf at three if we're being honest be great. But, yeah let's you know. do that i'm all for that well here's one that they're saying is going to be a surprise oakland raiders they're saying they kicked all the scouts out because they're going to shock the world here at four what do you think that means where are the raiders going i think the trade will happen i think it'll be the washington redskins moving up from 15 to four um, and that, I mean, I, you're spoiling my entire top 10 of my mock draft here, by the way, but uh, uh, no, nobody's listening. Yeah, that's right. No, we'll just drop it tomorrow <laughs> and you guys can check out the rest of it. Um, I shouldn't even give the bills pick to be honest. I should just leave a cliffhanger and walk oh, out. Come on. <laughs> but, uh, no, I'll, um, I'll say this. I think Washington will move up. I think they'll give up their, their 15th pick of the draft this year. I think they'll give up a first rounder next year. Um, and I think a third rounder, they've got quite a few picks in this third round and, and just, you know, date late day two and, and day three of the draft where I think they'll give up uh, enough to get into the position. And I think they'll take Dwayne Haskins. Their quarterback room is God awful. Uh, you've got Alex Smith with one leg. You've got Case Keenum. You've got Josh Johnson from the AAF there, um, even if that's even a thing anymore. So really, there's just not a whole lot to, to be excited about. It seems like they're out on Josh Rosen. And it seems like with them not even visiting with Kyler Murray, they kind of knew, okay, we need to put our attention somewhere else. Dwayne Haskins just makes a ton of sense. You don't necessarily have to play him right away. You could play Case Keenum. So uh, I, I like Dwayne Haskins, though, and he's the the number one quarterback on my board. Interesting. I don't love uh, Haskins, so we'll have to talk about that offline sometimes. I, I don't know if you knew this. I watched a lot of Terry McLaurin film yes. uh, this in year. Your shed. In your yeah. shed. In my shed. I watched a lot of it, and I have to say I, I didn't love Haskins uh, from what I saw. But So I want to get your opinion on that maybe offline sometime. But I want to get going on this. Let's go to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, this one's a little bit interesting to me, what they're going to do. I've heard a lot of uh, trade rumors about Gerald McCoy, possibly. And I know, uh, Greg, that's something we've talked about it. a lot. Yeah. Uh, and so maybe the draft swings something where they can really afford to do that. Where do you think they are? Where, where uh, are the bucks? I mean, it, it was hard for me to sit there and, and not think of Ed Oliver. But with Vita Vea last year, sure. Gerald McCoy still on the roster. I don't want to get too crazy. Um, I, I think they have a serious need for a number one linebacker. Quan Alexander's gone, and I think Devin White makes the most sense. I think he's probably the consensus player on most draft boards as the top linebacker, not specifically mine. I think Devin Bush would be the way to go. Uh, but Devin White makes the, the most sense. He's athletically gifted, ran a 4-4 in the 40-yard dash, has the range. Mental processing is a little bit of a concern for me. I think he second guesses himself, doesn't shed blocks the way he's supposed to. Uh, but again, he's, he's everything that you need out of a linebacker one. So I think that's going to be the directions for the, or the direction for the bucks. And that's kind of been out in the open since the combine. I love quarterback and linebackers getting picked here. Uh, that yes. is part of my dream scenario here. So let's every, get every cornerback, quarterback, linebacker. All yeah, do it. DK Metcalf, throw him in there yep. too. Uh, I'm all for it. Uh, all right. So we're, where are we at now? New York giants on the clock. Haskins is gone. Haskins gone. What I are they going to do? I was very tempted in taking Daniel Jones for them. I think it's it's very possible. Uh, but I Dave Gettleman is a 
best player available first kind of guy and the best player on the board is that Oliver. Um, so that's going to be the guy that I think that they end up taking. Um, he's a fit for their defense. They, they run multiple fronts. I, I think that, you know, a lot of their defense is based off of a, a three, four, but I think you can put at Oliver really anywhere and he will, I think essentially thrive. I think he's going to be a very good player. He's versatile, disruptive. It's unfortunate for, uh, Bills fans, if they wanted him, but I think he'll be off the board. So I think that'll be the guy that uh, the Giants take first. Definitely a lot of Bills fans want Ed Oliver, and the consensus on a lot of the mock drafts has been Oliver, especially leading up here. So that would definitely disappoint a lot of Bills fans. Uh, would you be upset about that, Greg? How, do you, how would you feel if Giants are taking him there? Um, I, I mean, obviously, I understand it because I think he's the third best player in the draft. Um, so I, I can't fault them for taking a great talent but yeah it would be i'd be devastated and saying swear words when i do watching it live tomorrow yeah but right now there's a lot of talent still available and guys that i'm totally content with yep. are, are falling my way here so let's keep going here jacksonville jaguars doug marone our old nemesis there the old miserable whatever i got other words bologna, for, bologna yeah. sandwich eater yeah uh what are those guys doing down there a ton of needs in jacksonville and, and this is one i've been paying attention to because it can go a lot of ways yeah, and that's the thing. I think they can go in a lot of different ways. I think it'll be the offensive side of the football now that Oliver's off the board. Um, I don't see them going after a linebacker, but uh, I, I wanted to go Hawkinson really bad simply because I just wanted him off the board. Simply, I, 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 I love Hawkinson. I just don't want the Lions to take a tight end personally. Um, but I, I personally think uh, they're going to be interested in Jonah Williams. I, I think that's going to be the guy that they zero in on. Um, and I, I think he's just a natural fit for them as a left tackle. I think that's a player that you can plug and play from day one. He's the most technically sound offensive tackle. And uh, whether it's you're going run first with Leonard Fournette or using Nick Foles to pass, I think you have to protect your investment in Nick Foles. And I think this is the way to go. So Jonah, Jonah at seven. So this is start where I start to get a little bit nervous. And I start pacing my house when Ed Oliver and Jonah go, because those are really two of the guys, maybe two oh, of yeah. the three to four guys where I'm super comfortable at nine and I like, and I'm, I'm happy that those guys are there. I think Jonah has suffered from being too good for too long in a lot mm -hmm. of fans eyes. And they think of it as a safe pick or whatever. And I, I don't think they realize how good he actually is. Um, and I would love that pick. And so seeing yeah. those two guys off the board, I start to get a little nervous. Greg, are you, are you pacing your house on draft night? I'd start to get a little freaked out. And I think that you described Jonah well in that people equate high floor safe pick as no upside and no ceiling and that's not what people are saying that all right maybe if a guy like the with the physical tools and measurements of andre dillard hits every single possible upside of his ceiling maybe he ends up better than jonah but there's also a 90 percent chance that jonah is going to hit his you know realistic outcome and be a good player mm -hmm. and has a really high floor. So I think people think that means that, oh, he's just okay and not special. He's really good. And maybe he only ends up ever being really good, but that's nice. I'd love to plug in really good at left tackle for 10 years. Yeah, I was going to say, I'd like to not think about that position yeah, for the next I'd 10 years and have a pros pro there. So I'm a little upset. Detroit, I, this one is getting to me a little bit because of you. <laughs> uh, and because they're picking right before us, and I see a lot of similarities in the team's needs. I, and, I can see Matt Patricia wanting the same things as Sean yes, McDermott wants. Yes, I think they do, and I think the needs are the same, and I'm mad every time I do mocks when something goes to Detroit that I want. So hit us with it. I think I know where you're going with this, and I'm going to be a little bit mad, but let's talk about it. Yeah, it's going to be Josh Allen. Uh, <laughs> he's the fourth best player in the draft. I think he's uh, – a player that you can plug and play off the edge right away. He's really everything that you want from, I, I think, a, a player that can help in stopping the run. He can get after the, the quarterback. Um, he's shown the ability to drop into coverage. Now, I wouldn't say do it every single time, but I love his leverage at the point of attack. Um, I think he's done much better with his hand usage from uh, two years ago to this year. And again, the, they're showing the ability to to flip his hips, get into coverage and do those types of things. It's important. Um, and I think it's a player and a chess piece that Matt Patricia would love to have. Um, and you have to think Bob Quinn has drafted eight sec players out of his 25 draft picks. That's 32%. Um, he's going to go back to that. Well, I, as much as I would think of trading back is an option here. I just, uh, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I think with Josh Allen on the board, he's too good to pass up. 
yeah, this is one that uh, I don't know that I see him falling. And so I'll be extra mad if it falls this way. And he's there right there, pick before us. And then he goes to you guys. I'll be very mad. And I'll probably hit your DMS with some words that I can't say on the podcast. Greg, do you, what are you thinking right here? Uh, Josh Allen going to pick before us. Does that settle well with you? Um, I, again, the same idea as that Oliver. I, I think that it's the right pick. He's absolutely the best player on the board. Um, and you can't fault a team like Detroit for wanting to figure out how to use a versatile defensive weapon like that. And I think these top eight picks are really realistic. I think Devin White's a really firm choice in that top group. Obviously, Bosa, Quine, and Murray seems to be almost in stone now. Ed Oliver, somewhere in there. Jonah Williams, somewhere in there. Josh Allen, somewhere in there. So the order, you know, we won't know. But I think besides Dwayne Haskins, that was the one surprise. The Bills need a second surprise. So out of those first eight picks, we got one surprise in this scenario. The Bills need a second surprise to get in there of a second quarter or a third quarterback, um, one of the cornerbacks, a DK Metcalf, Andre Dillard, Juwan Taylor. They need a second surprise besides Dwayne Haskins to get in that top eight. And then we get ideally what we want, one of Bosa, Quinan, Oliver, Jonah, Josh Allen, one of those guys to drop here. I think we're okay, and we still have a good player to take right now that we're going to be perfectly fine with. Um, And right now there's still trade leverage available because both Daniel Jones and uh, Drew Locke on the board, there's a chance Bean can play Denver – Cincinnati, Miami, Washington, New York against each other and try to build up some momentum here to get somebody to want to move up. But um, this is a pretty realistic view. I think these eight guys being off the board with one surprise in Haskins is realistic. The Bills, this lets you know we need that second surprise to have the real blue chipper fall to us. So real quick here before we get into the Bills pick, because Eric just messaged me over on the premium Slack channel, which is uh, something we'll talk about later. Tony Pauline, who, if you don't know, is a, a fantastic follow on Twitter. 17 minutes ago, uh, tweeted word from league insiders is Christian Wilkins is getting hot and can move up into the top 10 right now. I'm hearing latest. He goes is 14 to Atlanta. Clearly, uh, this is not something bills have been thinking about at this pick. If he's getting hot right before the draft, I, I think we all know that Sean McDermott's going to fall in love with him and has probably fallen in love with him. And if, if he's heating up, does he become a possibility here for the bills or, or is it going to be TJ Hawkinson and, and kind of move forward? Oh, you guys want the good news or the bad news? <laughs> <laughs> the bad news. Just give it to us. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, I think Christian Wilkins is a good fit for them. I certainly believe that. I, I like Christian Wilkins a lot. I mean, he's a productive player, smart guy, finished college in two, two and a half years. Um, very productive at, at Clemson. I think he's uh, uh, got the work ethic that you want. I think he's got the the leadership that you want. He's smart. Um, but the thing is, is there's going to be that Daniel Jones hype. And I really do believe that the, the Giants could be thinking about moving up. And, and this is where the bad news happens. Despite Hawkinson on the board, despite Wilkins on the board, I, I think Daniel Jones is going to be the pick at nine because the Buffalo Bills are going to be trading back with the New York Giants. I think Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott, they're going to be on the phone. And you have to think about it. And correct me if I'm wrong. I do believe since Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean have been in Buffalo, they have not held their first round pick at its original slot. They've, right. moved, they've moved back when it was Patrick Mahomes, basically for Trey White. You look at this uh, or past year, they moved up to get Josh Allen. This year, I can see them moving back and the Giants taking uh, Daniel Jones here. You want to get in front of teams like Cincinnati at 11, Denver at 10, Miami at 13. Um, so, and maybe even the Raiders at 15, you don't know exactly what they're thinking, but you could see a a scenario where Drew Locke and Daniel Jones are off the board within the top 15 and and you, you see New York there at 17 going, well, what do we do? So uh, I think, I think Daniel Jones will be that guy. That's the, uh, the the player that sits behind Eli Manning for another year. And uh, I think that's how this, this top nine is going to shape out. So the, the giants will, or the, excuse me, the bills will be picking at 17. Well, I actually don't hate that. I, I think you thought you were going to give me bad news, but trade back is actually my number one scenario outside of getting Quinn and Williams. Uh, so if I can trade back, I'm all for it. Obviously, you do lose out on some talent wise. As long as you tell me they're not trading back to 17 for DK Metcalf, um, <laughs> which is, I think, what you are trying to say. And I don't like that at all. So I don't, I don't want to have that. I'm just going to refuse to acknowledge that. Yeah, 
I just only listened to the trade down part and the value and the yeah, assets la, that la, we la, get. La, 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 I, I, I refuse to acknowledge the other piece. So just you can just tell us if it's DK Metcalf at seventeen. Yeah. It's yeah. it's well, and and basically how it shaped up was, um, let me go over to the uh, to my post here. So, um, yeah, it's 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 tough, man. Christian Wilkins went to fourteen. Uh, maybe he could even go a little sooner than that. Andre Dillard went to pick before, and. Um, I just I had to go with the guy that I feel like is just he makes the most sense. I've been saying sure. it for pretty much a month and a half, two months. You need a number one receiver. I know yeah. fans hate it, but if you think Cole Beasley's going out there and catching, you know, 80, 80 90 receptions for fifteen hundred yards and fifteen touchdowns, it's not happening. DK Metcalf has that potential. I think he could be a guy that has eighty receptions for fifteen hundred yards and fourteen, fifteen touchdowns. Yeah. Um, you know, John Brown's not going to do that. Is John Brown even going to be healthy? We don't even know. Um, Zay Jones, I think the secret's kind of out on him. He is what he is. Could he get a little bit better? Sure. But a little bit better is not even DK, close. Yeah. It's not even close. So no, I, I get it. And at 17, I think this is something and Greg and I will continue to talk when you, uh, have to exit for your, uh, interview coming up here at 17. I think we're both can swallow that a lot more than at nine. So a yeah. lot of people projecting him there. So I don't hate it. And you are obviously, I don't know what the trade compensation is going to be, but you're picking up some other assets along the way. Anyway, I know you got to get running here. You're a busy man this time of year. Can you give us here before for Greg and I to discuss a few names, uh, other targets along the draft that the bills should be looking at or are good fits for the bills that, that maybe we're not thinking about here. Well, you know, it's, I wanted to put in a running back here just because those are fun and they're a little bit easier to talk about. Um, but because you guys have signed so many, it's it's kind of hard to, to pinpoint it. But with you guys, I think getting additional picks, I think there's quite a few players that you could be looking at. Uh, you know, in the second round, maybe a Chase Winovich out of Michigan could very well be on the radar. I think, you know, with his versatility, with his work ethic, he makes a ton of sense um, for what they're looking to do. If they go DK Metcalf, sure, that kind of takes a receiver off the board. But if they don't, Terry McLaurin out of Ohio State, I think is I, I think is a fit for what they are looking to do. Now, again, might be uh, similar potential to Zay Jones when he got taken out of the second round. Um, and then just on the offensive line, uh, Eric McCoy, Elton Jenkins, I think are both guys that make a ton of sense. Um, on the interior offensive line, another player I like as well, Nate Davis out of Charlotte. So awesome. um, I, I think those are probably guys that they're going to be really considering probably on the, the second and third day of the draft. So uh, we'll see how it shapes up. And obviously we can talk more uh, tomorrow and, and Friday on it. Absolutely. What do you got going on and where can people find you? And then go ahead and get out of here. Yeah. Smash the follow button on Twitter at Russ NFL draft. Um, that's where you can find me all the time. Uh, kind of a tool on there sometimes, no doubt. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I got the final mock draft going tomorrow. Um, cover one NFL draft podcast. We're going to be recording in an hour, uh, with Michael Kist of bleeding green nation. Um, Christian page and myself will probably do something as well. Um, and then, yeah, just I'll be around for the entire draft. So it'll be fun. Awesome, man. Well, enjoy the night. Enjoy tomorrow. And uh, I can't wait to talk to you as the draft's going, bud. Yeah, it, absolutely. Brother. Thanks guys. Hey, thank you for coming on, man. All right. Um, there's actually one of the cleanest scenarios, actually, because a lot of them were kind of stuck in this middle ground where, hey, either we're going to try to get a better asset than what they gave us, or they're going to try to get a better asset than what we gave them, and we're going to have to try to balance it out somehow. And it works out really well to be able to do theirs because their first round pick of 17 and their second round pick of 37 is a nice clean swap. And it's pretty much equal point value to the ninth pick. Um, and that's perfectly fine. We dropped down to 17. We're then targeting the best guy left out of Christian Wilkins, TJ Hawkinson, Andre Dillard, Brian Burns, DK Metcalf, Montez Sweat, guys like that. And I really think one of them will still be there at 17. I don't think that they would all go bang, bang, bang right in a row. Noah Fant, I think, is in play at 17. Um, so any of those guys that are there, I think we still get a really good player in this scenario with the eight guys that he rattled off. I don't think any of them 
at 17 are worse than the guy we pick at nine. Cause we're going to pick one of those same guys. I just rattled off. Anyways, I think they're all relatively equal tier of talent. We might as well just trade down, get the extra pick of 37 and still get a relatively equal guy. If we can get, um, you know, a guy of that caliber, like a Josh Allen and that Oliver, Quine and Williams, Nick Bosa, that's a slam dunk. And we obviously do that once we get just beyond there. And I think it's debatable if Jonah Williams is in that first group or not. If Hawkinson is there, maybe they're kind of in their own little mini tier after the top four or five and before the next group. Um, but once you get beyond there, you're talking about a relatively equal group of talent. I would prefer this exact kind of trade uh, get there. Then you talk about having 37 with we still have 40, we still have 74, we still have the two fourth and two fifths. That's where you can package 37 and something, 37 and 74. That gets you up to like pick 24 or 25. Then you could get another guy, say we see one of those guys that read a left start to fall, and all of a sudden you can get your first round caliber tackle and your first round caliber tight end or defensive tackle or whatever it is. Um, so I, I think it has a lot of potential. Yeah, no, I, I like the idea and I do think, uh, I really like Fant there. And I, you know, obviously we heard the Tony Pauline tweet, but I think Wilkins still could end up around that area. So I like the talent, uh, that's going to be at that around that 17 area, even though I haven't done a lot of research on it because I've obviously been ha- pretty hyper-focused on nine. Uh, but I, I like that amount of talent. And then what I've been seeing in all the mocks I've done is right before the bills pick at 40, Again, that 37 is a lot of talent. That's probably first round talent sitting right there. And that is probably what is most intriguing to me. Or like you said, packaging some stuff and being able to move up again, which Bean loves doing. He's done it before and he loves doing that. So from an uh, analytics standpoint, what you said is smarter. Sit at 37, make the pick at 37, which in this draft is probably equal to a guy at 20. Make the pick at 40, then package the other stuff. Maybe you come up with 74 and a fourth and a fifth, and that gets you up a little bit further. Or maybe you package the two fourths and a fifth to get back up into the third round. And then you package a couple more to move back up into the fifth. And then all of a sudden we're using seven picks instead of 10. Yeah, and really my goal this whole time has been to walk away with four to five in the first three rounds uh, Absolutely. players, and that's really what I want, and then leave with six picks or whatever it is, seven picks in the draft. Um, that's that's where my head's at, and what I'm hoping that Bean is trying to do is shrink those assets into more premium assets and then get out of here uh, with that. So uh, that's where I'm at. Do we want to go in and, and start our own version of a mock draft? Yeah, let, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, uh, I will uh, take over the screen share here. Awesome. Um, we'll go right into it and kind of share what we're looking at. Again, we're going to share fan speak. Both uh, you t- picked me onto this, and I, I kind of jumped into it earlier. Arif Hassan is a, a great asset, a great follow on Twitter, has a really good board uh, from The Athletic here. So we're going to use his board for tonight. Uh, both you and I, I think you stumbled onto that pretty well earlier, that it's uh, you know really seems to have some talented guys up high um yeah. so we'll, we'll go through here set him up um i have a really uh, uh i really do th- some things during my day but today i did <laughs> run through about four or five different mocks because i'm so busy <laughs> uh it was all with his boards and it was really the first time that i felt more realistic uh in these scenarios than i have with a lot of the mocks so i, I like this right now all right. So uh, we'll although go greedy to, goes at eight, I don't know about that. Yeah. No. Well, and we'll see because I think this is actually our worst case scenario in some ways where no quarterback went. So the first uh, eight picks went Nick Bosa, Quine Williams, Josh Allen, Devin White, very standard top four. Montez Sweat, we're hearing some weird things, but also some teams still high on him. Brian Burns, another kind of guy that could, you could, you know, take or leave, depending on some people are really into him, some people aren't. Jonah, I think, is the safest pick in the draft. Greedy would be a surprise there, but there are still people who like him in this scenario it's an obvious slam dunk they leave at oliver on the board um even though there's no quarterback taken i think this is the ultimate leverage spot for brian bean or brandon bean and he would be really tempted to want to trade down i think if ed oliver's there you sprint to the podium yeah i mean i think i do think there's a conversation between hawkinson and oliver here and i think that they're probably close on a lot of boards Uh, but yeah I think Ed Oliver uh, a lot of what we heard is they're hoping he falls and if he does uh, take him and nobody cares nobody's upset about that yeah I agree and don't get me wrong you're right afterwards you see Dwayne Lock you see Drew Lock you see Dwayne Haskins you see some of the quarterbacks start to go Christian Wilkins was the next pick Kyler Murray falling to 17 would be a shock Um, but I think this is going pretty standard Uh, Garrett Bradbury in the first round is now gaining a lot of heat TJ Hawkinson making it down here to 24 I think this area 
area here where you saw DK Metcalf fall to 26. Um, I think this area, Noah Fant at 30, Jeffrey Simmons at 29. I think some of these are why you hear some of the names. Jerry Tillery, these are a lot of names connected to the Bills where if things fall a certain way, you could see them package a couple picks to move up here and snag one of these guys. The analytics say not to, that we're still going to get a really good player at 40 and it's not worth giving up a talent like 74. I think some of the crazy mocks I know um, – Benjamin Solak and uh, Matthew Perino both put out trades today where there was a trade down. I think Matt had a second trade down, then a trade back up. Both of them ended up netting Christian Wilkins and Noah Fant both in the first round. Um, so I was ecstatic and spent a lot of the afternoon just, just drooling over those. Um, but I don't think it's far off the reality of what Brandon Bean would like to do. Now, whether he's able to do it or not is another thing. Um, again, here, we're getting offered some trades that in reality, I would accept both of those trades. We're not going to do it here just for the exercise. But if somebody offered us a third round pick to move down seven spots in the second, I think Brandon Bean would trip over himself accepting those. Yeah, I would. And yeah, it's hard for me. I, You know how I am with the mock scenarios. I saw a lot of those today too. And it's just hard for me to get... Nah. Super excited. I think that is what they ultimately want to do. I mean, I think anybody would want to get more out of bleed your asset for as much as it's worth as you possibly can. I think that's just smart economics. Uh, but whether or not they're going to be able to do that, we don't, we really don't know. And I'm not going to get myself too hyped up or I won't be able to sleep tonight if I can think that oh, I'm going to yeah. walk away with two first round prospects and a bunch of other picks. Yeah. Now they were. I will say in each of them, each individual transaction that they predicted was reasonable. I sure. don't think that they were out of line with any of them. Assuming that Bean could pull off, I, I think that Matt predicted five trades. Assuming he could pull off all five of them to net out that total is a reach, but individually, each of the individual trades were realistic and fine. So sure. it's not like he was pulling things out of thin air. Absolutely, yeah. Um, in the second here, we ran into uh, Dexter Lawrence, I think makes sense. And this year, Adderley, another name you hear, Josh Jacobs. I've heard a lot in the first <laughs> round. <laughs> uh, sorry. N Nikhil Harry, uh, obviously a stellar player. Uh, Debo Samuel, Chris Lindstrom, Rocky Sin, seven picks that are all right there on the Bills um, radar. But there's some real talent left here, exactly what we talked about. Right at the top of the board, Irv Smith, I think, is a great choice. You know, I'm a huge fan of Hakeem Butler, uh, Chase Winovich, another player, obviously, that uh, um, you know Russell was just telling us about that I think both of us see as a very likely scenario. Elton Jenkins, J.J. Arcega-White's had a lot of other names. Murray's that, uh, right he, there. You know, so a lot of guys that I think are very likely. Mc, but McGarry, I mean. Yeah, I, I uh, yeah, again, McGarry. I think again, we have a chance that one of these talents here make it to 74. Uh, and again, I love that pick at 74 and think that we're going to be really excited about that late on Friday night. Um, but I, I think it's a slam dunk here. If we had a chance to start at Oliver Irv Smith, I, I would be ecstatic. Yeah, I would love it. And I, this is, yeah, let's go ahead and pick Irv and, and we'll keep talking here. What this is the area where I get excited about that. Uh, what we were talking about with the potential giants move. Uh, you'd look at that list right there okay. and, and guys that just don't end up really quite following you. Chris Lindstrom kind of becomes available. Even Dalton Reisner is, is tending to be in those areas. You start opening up more options for yourself to really go back to back, almost not really back to back, but pretty close to back to back with probably three uh, starters right away out of this draft. Sure. And, and let's, uh, as I jump into the next one here, I'm going to scroll back up and let's look in that scenario. Let's say we did take that trade um, and that we did trade down from nine to 17 and we slot in right here. And let's assume that every player that went beforehand was there in this scenario, the bills would have had the choice of Andre Dillard and TJ Hawkinson. If we trade down to 17 and get TJ Hawkinson, that's going to be an absolute grand slam. Yeah, so, or Dillard, really. I mean, there oh, are yeah. people talking about him top 10. If you, if you can get a franchise left tackle at in 17, I'm all for that. Absolutely. Either of those picks, I think, would be ecstatic. And again, at 17, neither of us are huge DK Metcalf fans. But if we I like it much more. Yeah, if we get it to pick pick 37 along with it, I'll, I'll stomach that a lot sure. more reasonably. Then, again, you look down. I, I rattled off the names here. But then if we're picking at pick 37, all of a sudden you can package that with Chris Lindstrom, Rocky Sin, and then still get Herb Smith or Snagger. Smith there and again there's a lot of fans of Debo Samuel and the fact that you're walking away possibly with TJ Hawkinson um Rocky Sin and Irv Smith 
that's getting really interesting. Or sorry, you, we'd probably go Chris Lindstrom and Rocky Sin there since we took Hawkinson earlier. Or again, the the name that he threw out, Chase Winovich. If we started TJ Hawkinson, Chris Lindstrom, and Chase Winovich, that is a stellar start to the draft. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm excited uh, walking away from the draft. Just uh, as far as the improvement on paper, obviously we don't know who yeah, the yeah, prospects yeah. are going to be, but on paper you're really bringing in uh, contributing starters day one. And I know a lot of people, and, and this is something that we talked about quite a bit, Irv Smith, the size and the RAS score, and those things don't add up to uh, guys that have had success in the league before. But honestly, man, I know I'm a little bit of a homer with Irv Smith, but when I turn on the tape, I don't, it's not translating to me. And I don't know if you're seeing that or or what you're seeing there, but. Oh yeah. I I think that the comparisons, people get nervous about it. He does compare to Charles Clay, but he compares to what Charles Clay could have been if he was healthy and able to stay playing. The versatility, the athleticism, the after the catch, being a great blocker and a good receiver. He's, he's just a, a, you know, Charles Clay 2.0 with two healthy knees. And that's a compliment. That's not meant as some kind of slight. That's a good player. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree there. So, uh, yeah, and, and the athletic profile stuff just gets me with him because it, when I turn it on, I don't see it. And, and again, it, it's fair to bring that up. And yeah. it, if you didn't see it on film or you had any question on film or with the production, I think that it would bring that into question. But I don't think it's a reason to disqualify him completely. It might be a reason that maybe it's more realistic that maybe he's not the mid to late first rounder that some people thought he was. But I think that once you get past 25 or so, I think he's absolutely in play. Yeah, absolutely. So who we got here? Where are we so at? in the third round, it got a little bit dicey here. Again, some names I really would have liked to see. Yadni Kajust is a, a guy that I love to see the potential of him making it there is maybe even a redshirt IR to develop behind uh, Ty and Secchi. And Titus Howard is my other favorite to pair with him as a raw, you know, really just block a clay to mold into a future uh, tackle for us. And having a guy like them learn behind Ty and Secchi for a year or two even would have been fantastic. Um, we do see some talented guys. Or we um, we also saw Jalen Ferguson, a player that Eric and I mocked here last week um, and really you know were able to, to see some connections with. But we have some talent on the board. Um, O'Shane uh, Shimenez is the guy that's been linked with us quite a few times. Um, we have Charles Amenahu, who I know Eric is a huge fan of. I'm going to skip over this name for a second. We have Kalen Saunders, who is a, a guy that many people really like. Um, I, Gerald Willis is actually a guy that I've been coming around on. As I got, I've, I've gotten nervous we're going to miss on that window of D tackles and not be able to get the guys if um, we miss on Quint Quine and, and Oliver at the first pick and then we miss on Tillery and Wilkins and Simmons on the second pick. Um, I'm actually intrigued by Gerald Willis at this pick if we started out without a D tackle. Um, but I know that there's a, a name calling to you from this list. Yeah, and actually, well, there's two names that, real quick I want to mention. I think it's a little bit of a reach right here for uh, David Long, I, but I really like David Long's game, and I don't think they take a quarterback in the, a cornerback in the third round, but it is a guy that I think uh, archetype-wise, Eric's put out, he's a guy that fits the archetype, um, and if he's available and the board shakes a certain way, I really like his style, and he can play inside or outside, which is really nice if you're bringing in a fourth, fifth, cornerback option a guy that can be versatile and play you know both ways but yeah you would have a tough time in this scenario <laughs> you'd have to hold me down and drug me from taking mclaurin but i understand not taking him here either i know that he doesn't really give you the dynamic that the bills might be looking for in a big bodied wide receiver i think that he's is a versatile wide receiver and, and can make a lot of plays in the nfl and i think whoever gets him is going to get a really good wide receiver and uh, I just I can't get enough of him, and he is everything about the process. So I I could see McDermott really, you know, having met with him, and they spent a lot of time with him at the Senior Bowl, saying, "Look, this guy, let's find a way to make him fit." But I don't know that it's the need uh, right there. But he he's pretty well, sexy, just sitting right there looking at him. In year one. I think that it's very likely that the guy we draft is really going to slot in close to wide receiver five or six Um, wide receiver five counting that Andre Roberts is really at the tail end of that. Um, and is going to have to contribute on special teams, and he's the best special teams guy in the draft. So I do think that there's some benefits there. Now, my hard part in an honest moment, I don't know that I think he's the 74th best player in the draft and that I think I would very likely – 
always end up finding a Charles Amenahu, a Colin Sanders, who I think would be the more valuable player. And I would personally want to roll the dice that he makes it to that early fourth round pick or that he's the target you package the two fourths and a fifth to get back up into the third to also pick him. So well, here's, I, my, I actually think Amenahu is the better value here, but I also think Terry McLaurin's worth this pick. Well, so... I think that Terry McLaurin is going in the second round. That's going to be my hot ah, take for the draft. Okay. I, I think he's a second round guy. I don't think that I want him in the third or fourth round. I don't want him in the second round as much as I love him, but I think sure. somebody's going to bite on his potential and his ability to, like you said, contribute um, instantly on special teams. I think he'll be one of the better special teams players in the league for a long time. Uh, one guy that I've seen around here too, though, if uh, men who's on the board with him, Max Crosby, and I'm assuming he's already gone in this scenario. I don't see him. They have him rated silly. Low. Oh no. He, yeah. He said, uh, I think Max Crosby is big time in play right here. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, now, again, Max Crosby is the guy that I always look for there. Um, but I think that, you know, with the special teams ability and the fact that maybe we target a Saunders falling or a Crosby still being there uh, in that fourth round pick versus waiting on a wide receiver, um, I would support taking McLaurin here. And I think that he's worth this pick. I think it's just the last episode and you're just trying to give me something <laughs> special. So I'm, I'm all ready for it. I like it. You, hey, if you want to see it as me throwing you a bone, it's okay. I, yeah. I think you've convinced me that he's not some pet project. This is not some silly draft crush he's a talented player with upside that will immediately contribute day one as a special teams player and it, at minimum as a gadget guy and i think has the work ethic and the ability to contribute long term as a player that we can really see um turn into something down the line really special yeah and you know i think he's a poor man's robert woods maybe I, that's uh, not crazy it's which, not which i i like that and here's the thing that makes me feel a bit more p confident about terry mclaurin is i'm wrong a lot a ton, <laughs> especially about draft prospects man i don't have a good record of finding guys but guys way smarter than me love him and that double confirms what i am seeing so i feel confident there uh again i think this picks a grand slam i, yeah. I think if, if max crosby is on the board at the early fourth round pick here. I think they run to the podium and I think we are putting together, honestly, the best mock that we've done so far. Yeah. This is a great way to, to wrap up mock season. And I think here back to back, you're also adding, and this is a constant conversation. I think at some point here, once we wrap up draft conversations, we'll, we'll really get into pros the, what they talk about the process and the culture they're building. And I think you're back in back to back picks. These are McDermott guys. Oh yeah. Guys, we're going to end. There's another one staring us in the face here right now that both of us have done. And again, I, I do think that I'd love to, you know, cross our fingers and try to wait till the fifth round here. Uh, but our boy Mike Edwards, the safety out of uh, Kentucky, is sitting there. I think he's a great fit for what they're trying to do. Um, it's getting into the territory where I know you like to wait a little bit longer. I don't mind the idea with now signing um, of you know, adding in TJ Yeldon, I think it's really interesting now to, to grab Bryce Love. I think that you have brought up the point that we probably need to consider the potential that he never comes back from what he experienced. Um, I actually prefer right here, the name that went right before us, Rodney Anderson as the red shirt IR pick is a guy who I've heard uh, Todd McShay earlier today said, if no injuries were involved, Rodney Anderson would be the number one running back in this draft with a bullet. Yeah. And that, just he's had three season ending injuries out of four seasons and that everybody's worried about that. And you're probably going to have to redshirt him here. So I actually like the idea. I prefer it in the fifth, but the Bryce lover, Rodney Anderson pick to redshirt and then pair with, um, you know, on the IR for the whole season, but he's still in the room. He's mentoring behind uh, Shady and Gore. Then the next year we have Yeldon under contract. We bring out Rodney Anderson and then draft a guy next year. Now you're talking about a serious running back room if Anderson pans out or Love pans out. But I think at this point you're getting into the area where it's worth that risk um, because if you end up throwing it away, it's that mid to late round pick that hits at a low percentage anyways. Yeah, looking at the board, the way it's fallen here, I don't mind Love here and to the Rodney Aaron. Anderson point, like you said, if he falls there for sure. Oh yeah, I know, Anderson, I would have really lobbied for. Him. Yeah, our friends uh, over at the Rock Power Report, Waldman, Matt Waldman was on uh, with them and said the same thing. He he thinks that's a great fit for the Bills to take a guy in a redshirt year. So I don't hate this idea uh, of going love. Love was I fell in love with him last year as I was digging into prospects, and I really wanted him last year, and then he decided to stay. And uh, obviously, I thought that was a mistake. And um, here we are now, where he's he's fallen quite a bit with this injury. Mike Edwards, I 
love uh, for the Bills. I don't like him in this board at that pick. I've been yeah, I've, I've been I've taking him with the second, fourth, or in the fifth uh, pretty consistently. So I know that that might not be much if you really like a guy, but I think right here it's totally fine to red, red shirt love. We really do have to think about the future at that position. It's something we've debated quite a bit in the premium oh, yeah. Slack channel. Uh, what do you do with running back in 2020? Because obviously right now it's fine, good enough to get through this season. But 2020, there's a lot of answers left uh, on the table. And I think love at least gives you an asset to look forward to and, and that you don't have to maybe rush and overpay to do something else later. Sure. And I think that that's the kind of risk they're going to be looking at in that spot where they're going to have to say, do we want to risk that? And I'm going to say there were two picks that went that I think are very likely if we start to see the names there and they're torn and they get into this area, Drew Sample's a name that we've heard connected. Kings Kiki is a name we've heard connected. And then we get to this point here where you're floating in the very end of the fourth. Um, we have so many assets left that I could see them package both fifths and a sixth and say, hey, you know, Rams, or uh, let me look for one that I think is a, a better um, connection because they don't have a lot of picks. The Bears here at the fourth pick, uh, 24th pick here, they only have four picks in the whole draft. Hey, we'll give you both fifths and a sixth to give us this. And then we end up taking Bryce Love and get Mike Edwards or Terrell Hanks. Yeah. So I think those are two guys they would really like. And that that's the kind of move where, hey, we see them in a tier to themselves and don't think that this is going to turn out uh, to get both guys. So we're going to end up wanting to jump up. And that's the small kind of move you could see that would make a lot of sense. Um, unfortunately, in this scenario, we missed on both Mike Edwards and Terrell Hanks. Um, so let's take a look. We do have so far uh, defensive tackle and edge. I think we're good there. We have a tight end and a receiver. I think we're good there. We have a running back. We have not gotten anyone in the back seven on defense. We have not gotten an offensive lineman. So I think it's going to be one of those two areas. Yeah, I do like Chris Boyd here. And again, uh, to back to Eric stuff, he's an archetype player. And I know uh, Eric has been pretty big on Valentine here, but he falls yeah. a little later on our board. And this is one of those scenarios Boyd, where we run into player it. on the board. Yeah, this is a scenario we've run into a while where you say, hey, you know, maybe we pass on Boyd now for Valentine later, and then we get to later and Valentine's not there. So at some point, if you if it's a need and it's a guy that fits, you just got to take him. I agree. And I think this is the exact area they're going to look for that kind of thing and then try to fit in the right kind of player. And that, you know, having a guy like that who really stands out from the rest of the board, I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I, I want to walk away with a cornerback. I know I, obviously we don't want to do a high like PFF is saying, but I think especially if you miss on Edwards here where Edwards, you know, Eric yeah. has talked about, he can play slot. You've missed out on him. You missed out on long. You, you only have a few archetype guys left. And maybe you wait for Ballantyne, but you got to walk away with the guy. So I think that's a good pick. I agree. And I think here, Ben Burkhibben is a guy that I've seen connected. He did come in on a visit later on. You have your Khalil Hodge. Um, and again, I just like to say Sean Taki yeah. Um, So, you know, having some guys there, I think that's where we're looking. You know, once we get past Edwards, I never really fall in love with any guys. Saquon Hampton is a name that I think we did have a visit with, um, but you know, just not anything exciting. It really starts to get thin at offensive line. So, so, you know, I've heard Isaiah Prince, I think, is a an athletic model, but has a ton of work to do. Same idea. Martez Ivy is OK, but has a ton of work to do. Uh, Mitch Hyatt is a versatile guy. Phil Haynes is a guy that I've heard uh, connected here. It's just a big freak of a of a man, you know, kind of throwing guys out of the club. Um, you know, so there's a couple offensive line names, nothing that's terribly exciting. Um, anyone calling to you here in in the late board uh can you, can you go back to all here real quick and, and yeah. while we're talking too like i know a lot of people are going to want offensive line um in this draft and when we post on twitter they're probably going to kill us a little bit but i think this is a good example of what yeah. uh sean mcdermott and brandon bean put together in this off season that you know what if the board doesn't fall our way and, and we're able to add pieces at positions of need still that we don't have to force the offensive line because they i think they do feel confident enough in the offensive line they've put together to play uh nfl football in in 2019 team here uh, i and think again, would... we brought it up if if yadney could use your titus howard sure. make it three more picks there they're probably the pick but once they don't you're not going to force it by just taking a guy to take a guy you're going to want to get the best value and whether that's a man who colin saunders uh or terry mclaurin that we took you or O'Shane uh jimenez that you know i think that that's the way that you're going to want to approach that that you don't reach you take best player available and that might lead to the board that we have here 
Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, there's still some guys on this board, too. I think Edwards is not a very athletic linebacker, uh, TJ Edwards, but he seems, uh, from what I've looked at, a very sure. processy guy. Yeah. Um, so I'd be happy, though, with Burke, Burke Irvin or your boy, uh, however you say his Taki, name. Taki Taki. Taki yeah, Taki. It's going to be uh, everyone will love the jersey. Um, yeah. I actually think that I, I really, this isn't just, uh, you know, the funny name. Um, I think Ben Burkhaven is very process oriented. He is a special teams maven. Yeah. I think he would make a name for himself there. We had a visit with him. I think there's a lot of logic that a late round pick of Ben Burkhaven or Terrell Hanks are the two that I see most likely at linebacker late in the draft. So I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's totally fine by me too. And he's really going to have to carve out a spot on special teams. I really think the, if I don't see a scenario where they're holding 10 picks, if they do have this scenario, I think yeah. you start to get to the second half of the draft and they've done a good enough job bringing in talent on this team that a lot of these guys are really going to struggle to make a roster where previous bills teams, fifth sixth round guys you know are sticking because the roster is just not deep enough i think they're going to have a hard, tough time if they walk away with more than six picks of everybody making this roster just because of the amount of depth that they brought in it's, it's going to be real good competitive bottom of the roster battles oh I, I think there is going to be a really painful day on cut down day and there's going to yeah. be some fan favorite guys who don't make it that the people are going to be up in arms over absolutely um, if we end up using 10 picks which again I, you and i are in, in lockstep there that i don't think that's likely i know you laugh at it i do think one of these late picks could be a guy like a special a specialist like a kicker or a punter um so i do think that that's in play if if somehow they do pick 10 picks because then if he gets beat out by carter or Bajorquez, it doesn't doesn't matter it was a six round pick sure. um so I, I do think that that's potentially in play and then again i i think just like i'd be surprised if we walk away and don't pick any cornerback i'd be kind of surprised if we walk away without picking any offensive lineman sure I think that would probably come into play at this point i think you do start to look at a guy like an Oli udo he's the guy who came from second tier at elon college uh, was made a name for himself at the east west shrine game earned an invite to the senior bowl um and ended up kind of carving out a little bit of a role for himself. So that's a, a late, you know, block of clay kind of guy that, hey, maybe something comes of him uh, and let him, he might even be a guy that you could snag on the practice squad afterwards. Um, so I think that's a name that's in play here with one of these late picks. But uh, on the overall board, anybody calling to you here? Yeah, the only guys that's uh, really calling to me here is I do like Mac at Notre Dame, but obviously we address tight end, sure. and I don't think they're going to carry that. But it, it, say we weren't able to address tight end there, I think Mac's not one of those guys. Once you get past the three, I don't see a lot of separation between guys, and I like what I saw from Mac and uh, Granderson. I don't know what's up with his domestic violence issues, and yeah. uh, that all aside, I like the player that he is, and I I, I see him around this area quite a bit and i i do like him and i think that he could be a fit in buffalo uh and then you have porter gustin right there who's another guy that i know that eric is high on yeah. and you might be able to get him after this but i, I think he's a processy guy that, that can bring what brandon bean talks about a lot with the defensive line which is rotation uh and we're going to lose a lot of that going into next year and i think if they can have some guys that they bring in late here to go with crosby and just rotate that line moving forward i think they'd be pretty happy by that I agree. I, I think that those are awesome. I think Gustin is very likely later on pick, especially I know some information came out today about him using Adderall. It sounds very clearly that he had a permission documented player, permission and can renew that in September. That seems like a non-issue from everything I've heard, but I'm sure some teams will be digging into that a little bit more. Sure. Um, I think that some combination of Udo, one of those edge guys, and yeah, one of the specialists off the here in, in the last ones, I, I think Udo would be the pick in my opinion. Sure. I'll give you the lineman now, but I, I don't know if we're coming back on the specialist later. We'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, it, you know, I, I get it. These I get are it. If flyers, you keep 10 picks, I yeah, totally If understand. we use 10 picks, I think there's a higher likelihood of – a punter making the team than a second drafted tight end. But sometimes you just have principled stances that no matter <laughs> what anybody says to you, you're not willing to listen. And that's where I'm at. <laughs> um, I right do now. agree that unless you think you literally have Sebastian Janikowski, um, you don't draft a specialist. It's just silly. Yeah. Um, but once you, again, the likelihood of uh, six, seventh rounders making the sure. team and contributing is so low that, you know, I, it's, there's logic to it. I, I agree that it's probably not the best use of assets, but uh, let, let's see who's there out of those edge guys we were looking at first. Not oh, all. and of course we lost them both. That's all right, though, and that's what's going to happen in this area. Yeah, and yeah, you this don't is, really care. Goes. 
Yeah. Uh, I don't see anything that's jumping off to me as I need this um, guy on my team. Position wise, you know, I, I don't even know if there's a name. I like Gary um, Johnson. He's fast. Okay. Saquon um, Hampton, I think, would be a, a pick that we didn't pick a safety yet. He came in for a visit. Um, we only have one guy, you know, in that that back area in the in the secondary. Sure. So he's probably a logical pick. We'll go with him. Um, and then I'm just looking position wise. We got a tight end. We got a running back. We got a receiver. We got a guard. We didn't go O tackle, but there's no one left to tackle. Um, yeah. Yeah, they would take the punter here. I think it's time. I hate you a little bit. <laughs> That's all right. We did. We made it six weeks here, and until the very last mock, it was the first time we took a specialist. So I think we did pretty good. I don't know. I don't want to watch a, a three-legged uh, <laughs> kicking battle all summer. Punter Blues 2019. It will be intense. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, where we just th- throw a name here up on the board. All right, uh, so we we know this isn't a scenario that isn't going to happen, right? Yeah. So there- here, yeah. Here's the recap. Here, here's where we walked away from. Um, we hit every need that was listed there. Although you know, I, th- I think of Eli Olai Udo as a tackle, not a guard. Um, but we started out with that Oliver at nine. We talked through the scenario with that trade down and the value that could have been there. If we went to 17, we think we would have walked away with Hawkinson and then probably got a combination of Lindstrom, uh, Rocky Sin, or Chase Winovich. I think that really shows the value of that trade and what we could have walked away with there. Um, in this scenario, we got Ed Oliver, tight end Irv Smith from Alabama, Aaron Quinn favorite wide receiver Terry McLaurin mm-hmm. from Ohio State, uh, edge rusher Max Crosby, which would be a phenomenal talent or a value in the fourth round if we got that. Red shirt running back uh, Bryce Love, who we would probably stash on the IR for a year to to mentor behind uh, McCoy and Gore and then be healthy and ready for 2020. Cornerback Chris Boyd, again, another great value in the fifth round. Linebacker Ben Burkirvin from Washington, again, another special teams player that could really add value. An enormous human and Ole Udo, who really is just a younger version of uh, uh, Ty Inseki, and I think would mentor behind him really well. Safety Saquon Hampton from Rutgers, again, another special teams player. And then punter Mitch Wisnowski out of Utah with the last pick. Sure. I think that sounds great to me. I think you walk away with four guys that are going to contribute this year. Max Crosby, I don't know that he's going to make a huge impact uh, year one, but I think he is a guy that makes an impact at some level year one and fits right into that rotation that they're trying to have. So I'm totally cool with that. Bryce Love, you're stashing a guy if you're stuck with these picks that makes that a little bit more palatable that you have a guy that you don't really need to put on this roster and you can keep some talent on this roster and and move him next year back onto the roster where where you're going to need some bodies at least. Uh, So I, I like up to that point. And then really from beyond there, I think, you know, we went with what was available to us and, and that's fine. But again, it's, they're walking out of this draft. I really think with six or seven picks, not 10. I, I think you're spot on. And I think that although it does seem kind of crazy when we saw those mocks coming out today with, you know, two trade downs and three trade ups, I, that kind of thing is realistic. I think that could happen. Um, you know, you think about it in the draft with uh, that we went two years ago. We traded down for Trey. We traded up for Zay. We traded up for Dion. Um, we moved around three, four times. We moved around again later. Last year, we traded up for Josh Allen. We traded up for um, for uh, Tremaine Edmonds. Um, that is Brandon Bean's MO. He's going to want to go get his guy. And I think that although it's hard to pre- – I think you're spot on and not getting ahead of ourselves in – predicting exactly what trade and when and what the compensation is going to be. That's probably smart not to get ahead of ourselves, but predicting the fact that there probably is going to be multiple trades, I think is accurate. I I think that if you gave me the over under of one and a half trades by the Buffalo bills over the next three days, I would take the over. And I think that it's likely better than 50, 50 that we have more than one trade over the next three days. Yeah. What I've been thinking all along is not even so much trading at a nine. I think it's going to, obviously things are really starting to heat up right now with the talk about, you know, especially with the Redskins trying to hit up and that might set off something entirely different with other teams starting to scramble up and values going out through the roof for quarterbacks uh, right before the draft here. But I've thought all along that they'll stay at nine and then the trades will happen beyond that just because of the amount of assets that they have and trying to get back up in, move back up into the second or third round, whatever that is, um, and, and moving that way. If they stay at nine, back to that t- Tony Pauline tweet, 
how comfortable are you with a guy that has recently been late first round and all of a sudden here two days before the draft, the day before the draft is moving up into the 14th uh, pick and taking Wilkins at nine. If, if Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott fall in love with them and stay at nine, I didn't really get to get your take on that. Where are you mentally processing that? Um, I think you have to get over it. And, and I have been, you know, I'm going to be hypocritical. It's the opposite of my kind of stance on DK Metcalf in that, you know, Oh, all of a sudden I feel okay with him at 17, but I wouldn't at nine. Um, and that I had felt the same about Christian Wilkins. And I felt like he was in a defined tier after those guys, but now you you know, I, I wish I could pull it up here. I had it handy. Aaron re, or uh, Eric rattled off a crazy list of process oriented things. And just so I know Russell mentioned some of them, but, you know, Christian Wilkins played 50 plus games at a top tier program, graduated in two and a half years, won the equivalent of the academic Heisman. Yeah. Um, is a beloved player that is at a position of need with excellent production. He checks every single box and that no, maybe he's not the freak athlete that Ed Oliver was, but he also has an awesome athletic profile. He was really up there in the RAS score, the you know relative athletic score. And I think that it's just something that I, I had built it in my mind that it only made sense if, um, it was a trade down and it only made sense if we were going to get some additional value out of it. Um, and don't get me wrong. I would feel better if it was, um, you know, that way and that we did get something extra, but a player like that, that I think we still would be really happy with. I probably just need to get my mind around it and realize that he would be a perfectly fine pick at nine. And that's not some disaster or worst case scenario. No, absolutely. So I, where I'm at with it too is because of all the boxes that he checks that I don't love it again, like DK, but I like it more because what, what concerns me about DK is what I see on film. And I don't really have concerns with what I see from Wilkins. Uh, I just don't know that he's, like you said, I think he's definitively in a different tier. And so that's where my problem is, but I don't see anything on film that scares me where there is things that I see on film with DK Metcalf that scares me. I think that's my biggest difference is some of the things from DK is I'm not sure that they can be untaught or if he has it in him to change some of the things like giving up on routes, running pretty sloppy routes, not being in the game when he knows he's not getting the ball. I think those things are pretty much telling of who a guy is as a prospect. And that's what scares me where none of that is available. With Wilkins. I, th I think he's the actually complete opposite of that is what, what he does make up for in talent. He gives you in motor and heart and all the things that you want out of a guy. So I think that's really where the difference is for me and where I can get over it a little bit differently. Yeah, you're right. You're, and you're spot on. It's just, you know, having to get our minds around that. And I think we get caught up and I think you and I are a perfect example here. We are plugged in fans we don't have sources we're not doing this professionally um we we both take it very seriously and invest a lot of time in it but we are simply reacting to the information that's out there we are hearing this now that oh christian wilkins is a late riser no he's not we're just now media sources are finding out that oh hey there were a whole bunch of teams that had him ranked really highly and were really excited early on that nobody was talking about him and now all of a sudden people are realizing that oh we're not the only ones that have him ranked eighth overall and that that's what's coming out it, he's not literally rising and that teams are moving him up the board we're just finding out about it now that hey they had him ranked in the top 10 the whole time and that now some of that's getting out and that teams are getting nervous that oh we thought we were going to be able to snag him at 23 and that was going to be awesome and now we're realizing that oh crap he's going to be gone yeah and i can see a scenario where the bills had in mind you we they talked about brandon bean talked about running through all these different scenarios just like we do mock draft scenarios where they uh predict trades whatever possibilities can come they've been doing it over this last week and i think they had a few scenarios where they get to 15 or whatever it is those picks and they're really happy with wilkins there and i can see a scenario where brandon bean really thought hey we're gonna we're gonna steal this guy out of the draft and it's a guy that we like and we're gonna steal him out of the draft and now other teams maybe we're hearing inside information and other teams are feeling that too, that, Hey, we, we can kind of get this guy in this area. And, and when that starts to happen, guys do things that maybe they wouldn't normally do and take a guy ahead of, ahead of where they would. But if you take a guy at 15, 
I know in the top 10 is different than at 15, but I feel like if you take a guy at 15, then you should be fine with taking him at nine too. You're not getting a blue chip prospect at this point. It's just not, there's a big difference between those top three picks and where you're at between that nine and 15. And and we can have an economic debate about the opportunity cost there. But I, I think that if you're happy at nine, 15 is an leap. It's not a huge illogical leap to be happy at, at that pick too. Yeah. And again, it's, I get caught up in, like you said, opportunity cost and value proposition and that you build your board, but the, the way the tiers are, it's again, it's not a ranking one through two fifty six. In my mind, there's five guys that are a tier. And then in the next tier, there's probably 12 guys in that. If we can get one of the five, which in my mind is Quinan, Bosa, Ed Oliver, Josh Allen, maybe Jonah or Hawkinson, depending on how you build your board. Um, but formerly, I personally felt like it was Montez Sweat. I've now kind of backed off of that because I've heard enough about the hard issues that I don't even know where he's going to go. Um, if you can get one of them, it's a slam dunk. Once you get beyond there, I think there's another 10 or 12 guys that are first round caliber, but I'd much rather trade down and snag one of them at 17 than just pick the one that we kind of feel the best about at number nine because we feel obligated to. So if we do that and it is Christian Wilkins or it is DK Metcalf, I'm there. I'm on board. I'm going to make it work. I'd feel better about them if we got it with a trade back and another asset, especially something like pick 37 where we get another elite high-end starting caliber player right off the bat. Um, but I, you know, if anything, and I think we've heard it in the chat, we've heard it in the cover one premium Slack channel. Um, the feeling of going into this, especially last year where you and I both were not big fans of Allen, I was a huge, um, you know, hugely against the the trade that we gave up for Tremaine Edmonds, even though I liked him as a player. Um, and they both turned out fantastic. And I can't imagine the Bills without either guy. And being able to be in this position now, um, I have full trust in Brandon Bean and his staff and, and uh, Sean McDermott and whoever they pick. I'm going to get my head around it and be okay with it. All right. Well, I got a couple more questions for you, and we'll, then we're going to wrap this up here because I know you got a lot to do arguing online uh, with people about this stuff. So uh, real quick, obviously, our show here tonight was sponsored by the Buffalo Sports Card Convention. As I said earlier, if, uh, you're just tuning in. Local sports card memorabilia show takes place at the Polish Falcons in Depew every other month. Next one is May 18th from 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. $2 admissions. Tons of great vendors there. You can find them on Twitter at BSC Conventions, on Facebook at Buffalo Sports Card Convention, and online at buffalosportscardconvention.com. As a sponsor of the show, they graciously gave us two autographed pictures to give away. Uh, so we're going to have two winners here. One is a Stevie Johnson autographed picture. And then the other one is a Trey white autographed picture. I was going to try to cheat this and win it somehow, but I knew you guys he did. He tried uh, because I think it would look great right up here behind me. But one of you guys is going to win this actually two. Of you guys are going to win one each and the winners are wait for it. We're going to go with the two guys that just commented last. Anyway, Ron Beck and Nicholas Lowe. You guys get in touch with Greg, myself, uh, on Twitter or at cover one, at cover underscore one underscore. Get in touch with one of us. Uh, we'll get your information. We'll get those pictures shipped out to you. And thanks again to the Buffalo Sports Card Convention for sponsoring this show. Uh, we really appreciate that. And it, it gives us something to give to you guys for coming out uh, and joining us because we really can't do it without you guys, uh, the fans. So thank you for that. Real quick here, Greg, and, and then I'll kind of follow up on this conversation too. I want to get your deep down inside trades aside, best case scenario at nine. Who do you want? I don't care about how other stuff falls. What do you want the most at nine for the Buffalo bills? And then I want your, what's your worst case scenario where you're not even thinking about getting online tomorrow because you're so upset, maybe crying a little bit and, and mad at me yelling at me about stuff. All right. So um, I'm not going to say Quine and Williams because I don't think there's any realistic scenario where Quine and Williams makes it to nine. I do think there's a realistic scenario that Ed Oliver makes it to nine. So Ed Oliver is my slam dunk wish list pick. Um, now, Quine and Williams is my number one player. I'd love Nick Bosa. I would be really happy with Josh Allen. But out of any of the realistic scenarios, fit, need, talent, 
elite, uh, you know, profile and upside. Ed Oliver is my wish list guy. He's my number one with a bullet. That's the guy that I want. Um, my worst case scenario, people will probably think I'm going to say DK Metcalf. And there's a piece of me that does want to say DK Metcalf, but I at least get it. And he, the more I've heard about him, the more interviews I've seen, I realize that he's probably more of a fit than I want him to be. So he's not my worst case scenario. My worst case scenario is Rashawn Gary. If we take Rashawn Gary at pick nine, I will say inappropriate things on the live stream tomorrow, and I will have a really hard time swallowing the logic of why. Um, I don't think he tries hard. I don't think his production was anything. Every time I watch film, Chase Winovich is the best guy on their defensive line, and I don't even think it's that close. Um, So he's my worst-case scenario. If we take Rashawn Gary, I will have some serious – processing to do to get my mind around that yeah i like both of what you said and just because for the sake of the show and i actually feel this way quite a bit uh, i'm gonna go with my best case scenario walking out of here uh at nine with jonah williams i've gone back and forth on it he was the guy that i liked at that position from the start of this and he's always been there and i i do think like i said earlier that he's suffered from being too good and consistent and that people have kind of gone up and down on him a little bit throughout this process. And I do think Ed Oliver has way higher potential to be a much better player in this league and something we talked about, but I like the idea of that consistency. I feel like I know what I'm getting out of Jonah Williams and that conservative approach is something that I like at nine. And I would like to be able to just give Josh Allen something for the next 10 years, if he's our quarterback for the next 10 years. And I'd feel really happy there. So I would love Oliver there. I'm not saying that. I just, I really like the conservative approach of Jonah. And I I think he is that safe, but not in a bad way, not saying correct. Settling for the safe thing. I, I think it's a good pick and safe. Yeah. I think that again, I said it earlier. I think people see safe as, oh, he can't end up that good and he's just going to be okay. Jonah Williams could go to seven Pro Bowls. Like He he has long-term upside. Just like he said in his interview, uh, people were like, oh, well, you know, are are you open to play in other positions? And he said, hey, you know, I'm willing to play anywhere they want me to play, but I just want you guys to know I'm the best offensive tackle in college football. So – that's the attitude that I want. A guy who's willing to do whatever it is, but just don't get it don't get it twisted here. I'm the best. Um, and that's the kind of guy that I want. And I know that uh, we threw around Andre Dillard as a you know perfect you know, physical specimen and an upside guy. And I know Eric had somebody bring up and joke with us. Uh, just an FYI, uh, Jonah Williams' arms are longer than Andre Dillard's. And everybody yeah. was joking about him not having that. So um, I think that uh, Jonah's a great pick. Yeah, and Jonah, it comes back to, again, what I said about McLaurin, where I like this guy, but then I go to look at people that are smarter than me, and especially people that really know offensive linemen, and all those people say that he's going to be a stud at the next level and that he is a pro ready stud offensive lineman. And that just excites me. And so either of those guys I'm happy with, and I've, I've also even talked myself into TJ Hawkins in there. I think the only thing that I would hate and I, I'd be pretty mad about and, and maybe not willing to get on Twitter because of the things I'd say is uh, like you said, I think it's really a few of the edges, but definitely Gary sweat would be up there. Although I think he's well fallen out now. Uh, the- I, I think way less likely. And again, you know, I like him a lot more than Gary, but now sure. when you're talking about a risk profile yep. of what's there, the issue at Michigan state, some of the other things that came up as boards completely. Yeah. Like I I'm fine. I've backed off that. And he yeah. was one of my top guys early on. And Burns is another guy that yeah. still some fans are clinging to. And I won't be happy with, it. I think he's a Supreme football talent. Just not for my team. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I think very similar. Those are risk profiles that I don't want to see a pick nine the same way that I felt about DK Metcalf. I like DK Metcalf. I think he's an interesting prospect. I'm fine with the argument that he's wide receiver one. I don't think he has the injury history and the production be a top 10 pick the same way with Rashawn Gary, the same way with Montez Sweat, the same way with Brandon Bur- uh, Brian Burns. There's enough risk there that I just don't feel comfortable with that. Honestly, the same way with Andre Dillard. I think that there's enough questions there. If you're going to do that, Christian Wilkins is the guy who starts to filter up there yeah. because there's no questions. And like you said, he checks every single box. Yeah. If, if I'm going to do that move, I want all the boxes checked. Yeah. Christian sure. Wilkins and Jonah Williams are those two guys on offensive defense and defense yeah. where I'm comfortable saying five years from now, this, I know it's, there's no way to say none. I'm coming back to this. Five there's, years there's no chance that Jonah Williams and Christian Wilkins are bus. Yeah. Now they may not be 
in their third Pro Bowl, but they are both going to be good NFL players. I am yeah. certain of it. Um, now, maybe they're not superstars, but they're just so low risk. I think that those are the kind of guys that if we don't get one of those supreme talent guys, those are the kind of guys you snag. Yeah, I love them. I love low risk guys. All right. So what do you got going on? I know that you uh, were planning on coming back here tomorrow night. Tell the people yeah. what is going on with you. So some exciting stuff. Uh, Russell Brown and I are going to be going live tomorrow. We are planning to jump on a round pick four, pick five, because we don't want to go for three hours all night long. Um, so we're going to give it a minute. We're going to be listening on Twitter. If we start to see rumors of a trade up, we're going to jump on immediately. But otherwise, we're planning to jump on around 830, 840. That should get us online around pick four, pick five. That'll give us about 20 minutes to a half hour to lead up to the Lions and the Bills picks. Um, so it will, you know, uh, humor uh, Russell and let him be excited about the Lions pick for a minute. We'll be able to recap those first five picks, talk about the scenarios coming up. If they trade down, we'll see how far they trade down and how long we want to stay online. But we're going to be there for you guys to talk through it uh we'll be real active in the chat talking with everybody getting questions from you guys uh being able to go live with you and kind of talk through it and just have a lot of fun being able to to see this uh draft through where really it could go in any million of directions so um you know just looking forward to it jump online with us and have some fun we'll uh take a look at it and then uh, try to make our way through for uh for the night yeah, absolutely. And if you want to know exactly when they're going to be going live, make sure while you're over here at YouTube, head over to our channel, subscribe that little notification bell that's over there. Click that and uh, you won't even have to second guess because as soon as they go live, it'll send a notification to you on your smart device, wherever you are. It'll let you know when we go live. So if you want to join that, make sure that you click the notification bell as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I guarantee you, as soon as the draft's over, Eric is going to be dropping tons of videos about these prospects. Oh, so you're going to want to be subscribed and all that stuff anyway here so while you're here tonight on youtube make sure you head over there and do that uh for those following the podcast make sure you subscribe and like there leave us a review that always helps uh we can't really do these shows without the the fan interaction and the support from you guys it helps a ton and greg where can the people find you if they uh, don't know who you are and what you're doing where can they find you and interact uh, come find me on the Twitter. Uh, I am at Greg Thompson, G-R-E-G-T-O-M-P-S-E-T-T. -T -T. Um, I spend an obscene amount of time there that's unhealthy for me, but I have a lot of fun with it. And then any other time I'm not on Twitter, I'm in the Cover One Slack. So uh, come on over, join Cover One Premium. The Slack channel is awesome. Um, it's such a great environment for everybody. We have a lot of fun together. We've been going a little stir crazy the last couple of days. We debated the most punchable faces. We've gotten into fixing the entire uh you know civil infrastructure um so it's gotten a little uh, a little uh sideways on us here as we're ready for the draft but um it's just a great environment it's something that i think you guys really enjoy yeah absolutely so head over to cover one.net make sure you check out the premium packages ten dollars right now get through the deal for the whole year that's the whole season uh as a premium member and that gets you access to the slack channel premium content all kinds of good stuff so make sure that you head over there and do that you can find me at aaron quinn 716 interacting and then again i'm also on the slack channel probably way too much more than my wife wants me <laughs> to be she hates the notifications constantly coming up on my phone and, and me getting immersed in chats there uh but definitely head over there and join us make sure that you're tuned in and follow following cover one on Twitter, all social media tomorrow. I was in the uh, our, our own side channel Slack uh, where all the work happens and people are talking about the articles they're dropping. Tons of content dropping tomorrow. Russ talked about his mock drafts coming out. Christian's working on some stuff. Uh, I know Eric is working on his kind of targets, at bills per round targets, which he's excellent at determining these things. And all Bills fans are going to want to go get that uh, and, and take a look at it. So please go follow at cover one at cover underscore one underscore uh and, and make sure that you're following all the content that drops tomorrow because it's going to prep you for the draft and then you can follow greg and russ uh during the draft so thank you guys for coming out tonight we really appreciate it it's been a long build up to this point i hope that everybody enjoys the draft tomorrow and uh then we can follow up next week with all of our new toys and start talking about some of the fun stuff next week uh thanks again for coming out guys we really appreciate it ron and nicholas make sure that you get in touch with us about getting those pictures shipped to you and again special thanks to the buffalo sports card convention may 18th 9 a.m to 2 30 p.m two dollar missions at the polish falcons in depew make sure that you go there if you like cool bill stuff uh like greg has behind him you're gonna want to go there and, and buy some of it so thanks again, some guys. of this is from there yeah thanks again guys and uh we'll catch you on the next one